This is the New York noir novel masterpiece of the Depression era. Better than food, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you. As always, hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Deliciosa. All right. What do we got today? Today I'm reviewing Nathaniel West's Miss Lonely Hearts. Uh, nope, nope, I'm not gonna spoil it. I'm not gonna spoil it. Okay, but first, rest in peace, Joan Didion, Eve Babbitts, and Anne Rice. All gone in one month. It's really kind of catastrophic. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Rest in peace. What a month. This is a title published by New Directions in 1933. I am partially sponsored by them in that they send me free books from time to time, but this one I got on my own. Harold Bloom writes in the first line of this book's introduction, the very first line, my favorite work of modern American prose fiction is Nathaniel West's Miss Lonely Hearts. Need I say more? Now, by no means is Harold Bloom's opinion the end all be all for me, it's not. It may mean nothing to you and that's fine. It may mean everything to you and that's fine too. But I'm sure we can both agree on one thing, and that is that Harold Bloom was extremely well-read, maybe more than anybody else in America. I imagine it took a lot to impress that guy uh, after what he'd read over his lifetime, which was, you know, everything. Was a tough customer when it came to literature. So the bar was high with him. A big thanks to my friend and patron Miller who recommended this book recently and uh, reminded me of it. He also gave me some supplementary material which helped in constructing this review, some of which I have linked below. So. Thanks a bunch, man. I've read that Bloom referred to novels of this caliber as being uh, of the negative sublime. Now I got that term from a third party article saying that he wrote that. I did not find that term in Bloom's writing himself. Though if he did write that, that's perfect. The negative sublime, that's, that's great. This is a very short novel that takes place in the middle of the Great Depression, uh, all about isolated misery. And we ourselves, I'm sure, can relate to such topics this holiday season. Now, I am not a financial advisor, and this is not financial advice. I'm not sure if anyone else out there is interested in economics and finance or has been paying attention to the news lately, but how shall I put it? Shit don't look too good. That's why before the dollar collapses, you should really consider investing your hard-earned money that's being eaten away by inflation in your savings account into something more practical, like this Ridge Wallet. Yeah, see what I did there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today's show is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet. These things are awesome. They are light, sleek, industrial, beautiful little minimalist pieces of modern design. Holds up to 12 cards plus room for cash on the back. They also come with uh, this little cash clip that you can attach if you prefer that. The durable material means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You can buy this one wallet and carry it for life. It will probably outlast us. This model is called the Narrows. There's like this topographic pattern on here etched into the aluminum it seems and uh, these coordinates, pretty cool. I'm not a financial advisor and this is not financial advice. But if you think inflation is bad now, 40% <laughs> of all US dollars in circulation were printed last year, four zero. If you're worried about inflation and you want to hedge, perhaps you'd prefer the gold. Voila, 18 karat gold plated Ridge wallet. And if that wasn't enough to convince you yet, just wait to see what kind of inflation is coming up next year. Get 10% off with free worldwide shipping returns by going to rich.com forward slash better than food and using the discount code better than food. The link is below. Thanks a bunch. Okay, okay. Almost immediately when you start Miss Lonely Hearts, you have a projector that starts a film noir in your head. You think newspaper man, you think 1930s New York, you think dirty snow outside, you think black and white, you think scotch and highballs in a speakeasy, you think dark nights of the soul, the darkest, shadowy cold, catastrophic poverty, and the miserable struggles of silent human beings all around you. You think F. Scott Fitzgerald's hungover nightmare. This is the opposite of The Great Gatsby. This is my style. The protagonist of this book is a, uh, an unknown man, basically, who works at a newspaper and manages a column for providing prescriptive advice, offering hopeful platitudes to those who write in because they've got problems. And God almighty, do they have problems. Initially, the column was a joke, but it has ceased to be funny for some time. The column is called Miss Lonely Hearts and that is the only name we know the protagonist by. Nathaniel West was an American author who died young in a car accident. I don't think he was very well known while he was alive, but he was, uh, I mean, you know, while he was alive, in his, in his short lifetime, he got out two, you know, knockout punch novels, highly regarded pieces of American fiction. The Day of the Locust, which I've reviewed poorly, don't watch it, is about the inhumanity of Los Angeles. That actually came after this one. And uh, Miss Lonely Hearts, which was uh, published in 1933. I think uh, Day of the Locust came out in 36 or 37. He had started doing uh, screenplays in LA. So if Day of the Locust was his uh, LA novel, and it is very much an LA novel, uh, then Miss Lonely Hearts was very much his New York novel. and. Good God. He was younger than me when he wrote this. He was like, he was probably, you know, somewhere around 28, 29, 30. And it's scarcely believable these days to think of an intelligence that profound in a man that young. Now let's talk about the writing of the book, how he came to write it. This is one of the best things about the book for me. Just 
Picture this atmosphere. This is exactly what I'd imagine. Picture New York at night. Picture a Manhattan hotel. Picture a lonely young man working nights there, putting his book together. Can you hear Almost Blue by Chet Baker? Just open up another tab on Spotify and put it on. Of course, that came out about 20 years down the road, but the feeling is the same. I love hotels at night. I would have been the manager of a giant hotel if I didn't absolutely hate people. I love the feeling you get being in a quiet lobby with only maybe one or two other people, with the attached bar, people arriving and departing, greeting one another, saying goodbye. To what soundtrack will the night's drama unfold? It's also cinematic. The story of so many people's lives intersecting and happening right in front of you. This is the New York noir novel masterpiece of the Depression era. It's a bleak satire with oceanic depth. According to Wikipedia, West died with his wife in a car accident uh, in 1940. Uh, on December 22 in California. He was 37. Four years earlier, this was published in 1933. Not a very good year. The jazz era is dead. Hitler is rising to power, and America is still in the throes of the Great Depression, which started, of course, in 1929. This is a great book for the holidays, if you're like me, you know, where the holidays are basically like a three-month-long eye roll in slow motion. No, I'm just kidding. They're great. Tell me, can anybody out there, like, actually listen to Christmas music? and not want to kill themselves. I mean, honestly, today, in 2021, I mean, really. For me, aside from the mwah, perfect economical writing, I mean, it is immaculate, almost indisputably. There are two striking things about Miss Lonely Hearts right off the bat. The first is just how visceral, how almost confrontational the depiction of human suffering really is. I mean, it's, it seems unusual in American fiction, actually, uh, for that period at least. The absolutely horrifying nature of the letters this guy receives, gruesome, tragic, miserable, and desperate stories of people who are truly being dealt a hand in life that is so fantastically cruel, it's nearly unfathomable. A young girl born without a nose, another woman with like an abusive, but not only abusive, like demented and crazy husband. He like hides under a bed for hours and hours in the, in the dirt just to scare her. It's like really like, whoa, that's fucked up. It was just like such a tidal wave and, and the letters just seem to be relentless. They just come to him. They seem to be piling up and just, just nonstop to the point where he can't, he can't even do anything with them. He's opened this door to the, the suffering of humanity and kind of made the call. And what he's receiving, he was not prepared for in the slightest. And it's forcing him to confront everything, himself, how he lives, what his values are, everything. He's, he's having a, an existential breakdown. It's such a tidal wave of humanity that he can't even deal with it. He made the call and now the world has responded. And it's so tragic, it's breaking him. These letters are signed as and known by Miss Lonely Hearts in names such as Sick of It All or Desperate. And the second thing that really stood out to me about the book was this character, his boss, his editor named Shrike. Shrike and his dialogues or monologues, holy hell. Wow, man. Jealousy, I, I don't usually get jealous of, uh, of authors. I am jealous of West's ability to create Shrike. He's a perfect character. I mean, it's, it's, he's way more interesting to me personally than Miss Lonely Hearts. We'll talk about that. People traditionally call him the antagonist, but that's, uh, it's been disputed. That's what's most interesting about him. According to Bloom, a descendant of Milton's most famous antagonist from Paradise Lost, in Bloom's words, a very American Satan. Probably what most people would picture when they hear the words cynical nihilist. But say what you will, uh, it's indisputable that Shrike has adapted to his environment. Shrike is the most powerful part of the novel. He is such a force to be um, reckoned with in every way, every way. He's competition for Miss Lonely Hearts. He's the antagonist. He's, uh, I mean, L Miss Lonely Hearts is trying to seduce his wife and failing. And he has these like monologues in, in the bar and they just eviscerate any kind of idealism that that uh, Miss Lonely Hearts is, is holding on to. And it's just uh, flooring. His dialogues are legendary. No matter which road you take, he seems to say, it's all a dead end. All roads lead to hell, whether via hedonism or art, exotic expatriation in the South Seas, working on a farm, drugs, or suicide. They all go to the same place. In fact, he begins vocally outlining these various options to Miss Lonely Hearts, as, as though he were the mind of Miss Lonely Hearts, frantically searching erratically for, for some sort of something to hold on to, for something to stand on and pursue with conviction. And it's personally my favorite part of the book. It's amazing. Here, check it out. Page 80 in this version. You dedicate your life to the pursuit of pleasure. No overindulgence, mind you, but knowing that your body is a pleasure machine, you treat it carefully in order to get the most out of it. Golf as well as booze. Philadelphia Jack O'Brien and his chest weights, as well as Spanish dancers. Nor do you neglect the pleasures of the mind. You fornicate under pictures by Matisse and Picasso. You drink from Renaissance glassware, and often you spend an evening beside the fireplace with Proust and an apple. Alas, 
After much good fun, the day comes when you realize that soon you must die. You invite all your old mistresses, trainers, artists, and boon companions. You give a stiff upper lip and decide to give a last party. And then he goes on to make a direct reference to uh, Wiesmann's Against Nature. The funeral for Desaisons Virility, if any of you remember that, where everything is black. Every, everything, all the food, all the decor, everything is black. Wiesmann also famously had a conversion to Christianity. As this excellent article by Dustin Illingworth on LitHub.com says, The Miss Lonely Hearts, Shrike repeatedly says, are the priests of 20th century America. But I think our shrikes have just as often played that role. Crooked proclaimers for whom a weaponized cynicism enables a telling of difficult truths. Some might see this as capitulating to despair. However, I've always seen shrike as possessing a fierce kind of courage. Unpleasant to witness, certainly, but suggesting immense negative capability. He, among all of West's characters, remains willing to contemplate the dearth of meaning beneath the brittle brass of American life. And this honesty, if not always valorous, hints at something like grittiness. A daring to acknowledge. Yeah, yeah, I, I, like that's what I get. Like, Shrike is actually somebody in the modern era, well, that, that era, but you know, just as well, it could be, you know, a character written today, somebody who is actually willing to tell the truth. Because reality and the truth are horrifying. People don't want the truth. You don't, they don't want to know. They don't really want to know. Thus, what Shrike does is he gives them platitudes. He actually, like, you know, he, he almost has, like, sadistic fun with it, like answering these letters of ac actual, like, you know, completely authentic desperation and um, suffering. The, the truth is not a pretty thing. I don't think that, that reality is a pretty thing. I don't think that it's necessarily horrific, but it often is. All I'm saying is that one must be prepared for the answers to the question one asks. They actually have to want to know. Because if you pretend you want to know, but you really don't, you're going to delude yourself, get angry, or have a breakdown. I'm not saying that I would be any different. Really quick, I am selling these bookmarks. They are $4 each plus shipping, just my face with a little reminder there. You can hit me up using the email below or DM me on Instagram. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So there's plenty of religious symbolism in the book. When he's younger, there's a disturbing story about the hackneyed sacrifice of a lamb by Lonely Hearts and his college buddies. It's revealed at one point that Lonely Hearts is reading um, Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. I still need to read that one. Also, thanks to Miller's professor, John Rogers, who is a Milton expert and who teaches at the University of Toronto, uh, and previously at Yale, where Bloom taught. I think Miller mentioned that uh, he attended a lecture Rogers gave wherein he was focusing on the same reading of Miss Lonely Hearts that Bloom was, in which the story is seen as a version of the temptation of Jesus in the desert by Satan. As Bloom points out, the story bears a strong resemblance to, not Paradise Lost actually, but the, the one that came after that by Milton, Paradise Regained, which I haven't read. But like Satan in Paradise Lost, you know, Shrike makes you stop and think think. He's not so easily dismissed simply as evil. It's not so cut and dry. And I've come across one person who actually argues for a, uh, an alternative interpretation. In quite a damning article I perused on JSTOR that I've linked to below, written by Beverly Jones, she argues that Shrike is actually a modernist anti-hero who expresses the hypocrisy and irrationality of Miss Lonely Hearts' religious mania. As a modernist anti-hero, Shrike has his own system of order to shore against ruin, an uncompromising cynicism made all the more impenetrable by the fact that there is nothing arcane about its major tenet. There is no meaning in anything, especially suffering, and there is no escape from it in this or any other life. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm still thinking about everything. But that's a very different opinion of the common interpretation of the book. And I think the fact of the book's ability to generate such differing opinions is a testament to its quality, you know, its depth and complexity. Shrike appears to be the antagonist, but he's, he's something else. Maybe Shrike is meant to be evil or Satan. He's not sympathetic. Maybe he's more of a, of a metaphor for the indifference of nature itself to human suffering. And the impossibility of, you know, simplifying the complexities of the modern human condition it takes me takes me right back to Paradise Lost, where Satan says, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Yeah, legendary quote, maybe the most famous from the book. Shrike seems extremely intelligent and more of a force to be reckoned with than Miss Lonely Hearts. Shrike is like the precursor to Gordon Gecko, who, you know, and you may argue with me, but Gordon Gecko was very interesting because Gordon Gecko was, you know, yes, he's evil, right? But there, there's actually a couple of scenes in that film which were really striking because it, because it, you, you can see his, um, what was brilliant about Oliver Stone's script was that you can, you can see why, explicitly why Gecko is doing what he's doing. And it's in the scene on the beach and it's in the scene in the car. He's chasing after time. He's trying to get time back, right? That was the brilliance of it. 
he is a he is a man who knows that he's gonna die. He is he is very clearly aware of that. That's the result. You know, that's what creates the man who does what he does in that movie. And that's powerful. Because he's not entirely evil, you know, it's not it's not that simple. He does things which seem evil, but you understand why. Well, I don't know. I mean, Gecko's pretty much without a conscience, you know, he is he's he's the word sociopath is probably not inappropriate, so take my impression with a grain of salt because because I do. I thought it was a complex character, and I thought Shrike was too. Gecko is very much a descendant of Shrike and Satan. Even after Lonely Hearts has a spiritual metamorphosis, so to speak. But he's the opposite of Miss Lonely Hearts. He's the result of a man who descended and built his heaven out of hell. He is a product of his environment and he assimilates it into himself. He is an assimilation of the, the evil around him. I'd really like to read what Nathaniel West had to say about Shrike. From that article by Illingworth again, perched between the towering anguish of his readers and the antic sophistry of his editor Shrike, a hatchet-faced Satan, the source of the novel's negative radiance, and one of the finest creations in all of literature, Miss Lonely Hearts is inexorably crushed beneath the dynamic native varieties of American despair. What a nicely written article. The native varieties of American despair. Beautiful. And Lonely Hearts is quite at home in that milieu. On the outside, Lonely Hearts cuts a pathetic portrait. He's mostly a failure. He's actually trying to sleep with Shrike's wife and failing. He's failing in his own relationship with Betty, a woman who he eventually marries. Spoiler alert. But he treats her like garbage in the throes of his existential anxiety. He has the air of a man who was coddled into obsolescence. And you know, I also, I also think to myself in these letters he receives from people, I mean like, um, you can't be naive in that era. Depression era New York in the 1930s, I mean, like, these letters, what in God's name did the man expect? How could anybody be that shocked by being confronted with human suffering of that magnitude at, in, in that time and place? But then I forget that, you know, we have the internet. We, we see this all the time. We are so numb to this. I mean, imagine not having the internet and sort of like being like, well, everybody in your circles or your vicinity uh, is doing pretty okay, you know, all things considered. Uh, and then just being, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, having one day Reddit right? You know, like where you can just read like the full culmination of all the horrific cruelty and tragedy uh, occurring in the world, not only right at this moment, but in the past as well, you know, so this is one of the, maybe the literally worst period in American history. And then came World War II. I finished Miss Lonely Hearts on December 2nd, 2021, the anniversary of he and his wife's death in 1940. It's a dark coincidence. So what did I dislike about the novel? So I want to read it again. I'm going to read it again and again, I know. And, and the great thing about this one is that you can do it quickly too, because it's so short. Mrs. Lonely Heart's conversion, his religious conversion, is really, it's kind of weak to me. Not that Mrs. Lonely Hearts is weak, but the, the reason for his change, it's, it's not at all substantial. Uh, it just kind of happens. That kind of was one thing I didn't like about the book. So yeah, Mrs. Lonely Hearts has a, has a change in character that isn't unlike, um, like the Buddha or something. He becomes a kind of rock, as he refers to it, but a devotee in his own way to Christ. Impenetrable, not imperturbable, but seemingly of a whole new quality and character. What triggers that is it seems to be a trip to the countryside with his, uh, his, his future wife, but it's, uh, um, I gotta read it again. He's more solidified, but he's, but he's still off kilter, as can be seen from his behavior. But it's somehow rooted, it seems, in some kind of irreducible truth, in spite of the chaos that storms around him and inside him. And I wanna talk just, just very quickly about the end. What's important to keep in mind when you read the end, while it may seem one way, and in fact, I've seen a guy write about it saying it happened one way, when it, in fact, it, it's completely ambiguous, when in fact, we're not told, that's, that's the thing. We're never actually given the explicit fate to Miss Lonely Hearts. So when you read it, it, it may seem like you, you know what happened, but if you go back and look, we don't know. It was fantastic, except I saw the ending coming like 10 miles away. You may too, but we're not reading for the plot. We are reading it for the characters and themes, and it is still better than food. Absolutely better than food. One of the best I've read this year, probably one of the best books I've ever read. Highly recommended, tremendous. In so short, it'll probably only take you an afternoon. Easy commitment, tons of bang for your buck. All right. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar and I pull out a name for every review I do. And whoever's name I pull out, I send a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. Currently, the coffee is from Myanmar. I love this coffee. It's delicious, if I do say so myself. If you'd like to get in on that and help support the show, you can check out all the tiers in the description box below. Thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate it. Unfortunately, international shipping is not included. Sorry about that. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Uh, Marshall, Marshall B. 
Thank you very much, Marshall. You're going to receive a really, really great book. Miss Lonely Hearts by Nathaniel West, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. And I hope you love both. I wish you and your loved ones a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Let's see if we can improve upon the last two, am I right? Well, please subscribe if you haven't already and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this. And always remember, bring a book wherever you go. All right, take care of yourselves. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. See all of you in 2022. Ciao.